Ready. Hey. Just in the middle of the field, 45, 50. Green grass in front of him, leaving Lions in his way. I am Jeff Joniak. Blitz is on. <laughs> Down he goes. Brisker. What was it like playing for Coach Dicka? Uh, I don't want to answer any questions like that. 61 yards. A Sunday stroll for Justin Fields. Oh, wow. And ta-da, and ta-da, and ta-da. Now, Bears Etc. Brought to you by Miller Lite with the voices of the Bears, Jeff Joniak and Tom Thayer. Super Bowl week has arrived, and it's episode 54 of the Bears Etc. podcast with Super Bowl winning Bears guard Tom Thayer. I'm Jeff Joniak. This podcast also featuring Hall of Fame finalist Devin Hester, an interview I did with him back in Orlando before the Bears-Tampa Bay game. I think that was week three or three or two, something like that. I spent a couple of hours with him with the Bears uh, broadcast department. Really deep interview about a lot of things, including... Uh, his bid to get in the Hall of Fame for a third time. We find out Thursday night if he'll be enshrined this summer in Canton, Ohio. And same goes for Bears legend Steve McMichael. We are brought to you, as always, by Miller Lite, the title sponsor of the Bears Etc. podcast. Uh, first of all, Tom, hello. How we doing? And uh, you'll be able to talk a lot about Steve, but we have a special guest taking time out of his very, very busy business schedule and life, the one and only Israel Adonijah. First, Tom, how you feeling? Big Jeff, I'm feeling good. I can't believe you can't remember week two down in Tampa because that <laughs> had lingered the concerns of the heat of that game, which always kind of challenged me because we played him twice a year that it, during my time with the Bears. And so, yeah, that Devin Hester interview goes back a little ways, but it makes it no less any more important. Yeah, so we'll hear from him in just a little bit. But we welcome Israel to Donage. Uh How you doing, my friend? And, and a very close friend of Devin Hester. But my first yeah. question out of the box were you on the, the kick return unit at the Super Bowl when he returned it for a touchdown? I was there. I was, I was there. Uh, it was, I mean, one of the most exhilarating, you know, moments in, in sports. You know, all week, Dungy and, and the Colts have been saying they weren't going to kick us the ball. And we weren't expecting them to. And I guess in their meeting room the night before, as a part of, like, hyping his guys up, you know, he, he ended with, you know, and, you know, we're going to kick the first kickoff to Devin Hester, you know, for kicking. And, and, and sure enough, they kicked it. He got it. It was just incredible. Every Bear fan across the world just erupted. The, 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 the ground was shaking. It was one of those moments that you pause and just take it in. It was, uh, it was, it was pretty special to be a part of uh, that moment and really his, his career. Do you remember who you blocked? No, I don't, I don't remember, but uh, I, I did. I, I think I, I, although it wasn't a great block, I, I barely got it. I did just enough <laughs> that, that he didn't make the play. <laughs> and Tommy, sometimes, as you knew, you played uh, on those units. Uh, just enough was good enough for, for a guy that uh, has probably earned more nicknames uh, of any player other than Deion Sanders in his career. Uh, from, from my mouth and others, uh, anytime uh, as an ode to uh, Dion and also uh, the Windy City Flyer, and of course, ridiculous. Well, I, I kind of have a connected question to that, as Jeff was saying. Izzy, I was on kickoff return my whole career, from my first game to my last game. And, and I blocked for Willie Galt, who was world-class type of speed. And we had designed um, returns set up that we would call the return because most of the time back in that generation, they kicked it to the center of the field and the returner returned it if it was in a catchable position. When you go back and you look at your returns for Devin Hester, were they specifically designed or was it kind of a little bit flying by the seat of your pants because he was such a dynamic seer of the field? No, they, they were specifically designed. Uh, Dave Tobe did a great job of gauging or studying, you know, the kicker, where, where was he going to place his best kicks, the wind, and then we'd call wedge right, wedge left, up the middle. And, I, I mean, kudos to Devin. You'll get guys with all that talent that don't stick to the plan. And often Devin did a great job of setting it up and really finding the lane between the wedge and the other guys that were blocked on the field. But, yeah, all our, all our returns were, were designed and, and, and meaningfully, you know, crafted. Obviously, he's the magic, right? He was kind of the secret sauce. But, um, you know, a few things we did is, you know, we used to set the wedge at like 10 feet from the returner. So I was the wedge setter as he, the ball was about to be caught. I gauged the distance. I set the wedge. When we got Devin, we were setting the wedge 15 feet away from the returner because 
you know, 10 feet. We weren't even at our blocks yet. He was passing us, right? He's just so quick and dynamic. Uh, but it was, it was, it was great to, to be able to really create a special moment, you know, in NFL history, you know, with that guy, you know, running the balls on, on all those kicks. You know, the anticipation of kickoff coverage for Jeff and I doing the broadcast was all about Izzy Adonage because he would run down <laughs> there and he would have some impact knockout type of hits. Did it incentivize you to make those types of hits because you know the returner that you had on your side and you wanted to limit the success of their returner just given the fact that it was always kind of a debate when Devin was on the field? Yeah, I mean, I think, one, you know, I always felt, you know, and our unit felt like we were – we felt our special teams was the most important – you know, facet of the game, right? We were going to give great field position to the offense. We were going to pin, you know, op- opposing offenses deep. And, you know, when you look statistically, it's hard to score if you're starting, you know, inside your 10 consistently. It's hard not to score if you're getting that ball 30, 40, 50, right, short field. And so we always felt that our special teams unit was like the secret sauce to a lot of the, the success that the Bears had through, you know, that decade while I was there. And and for me, you know, I loved being the wedge buster, right? I, I, I kind of wore, wore that chip on my shoulder, you know, you know, six foot six, 270, and I was coming down, like, to take somebody out. We felt that we were the reason they, that they, they kind of moved everything up because we were, we were absolutely – obliterating guys, you know, myself, we had Brendan, I and Badejo. I was like the hammer and he was the knife coming through. And we, we as a unit just, just did a great job. But I will say because I was doing so much damage as the wedge buster, when I became the wedge setter, let me tell you, they were coming for me. (laughs) They were, they were coming. (laughs) Well, uh, the great news is because Tom and I have bemoaned this the entire last couple of years, uh, the kickoff has become a real downer, and there it's just yeah. it's it's a it's a football play that they eliminated, but for, for right. no other better way to put it. And um, Roger Goodell this week says the NFL needs to quote find a way to keep the kickoff in the game. So whether they look at the XFL and, and see how they did it uh, with the low impact rule, there's the ten players on each team lining up five yards apart with no running starts. And uh, the kickoff returns increased and injuries decreased. I hope and pray that that happens because we're all talking about hoping and praying this week that on Thursday night, Devin Hester becomes the first return specialist to enter the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And uh, right now, it's, it's, a, it's a downer. It's a snooze fest. And it, it takes out one of the most <laughs> exciting plays in football. Izzy, please, tell me they can fix this. And how do you feel? Because... Hey, you you bore a brunt of the physicality of this and delivered it. Yeah. I, I love that aspect of the game. I think what they did moving up the the line, it was a disservice to to that to that series in the game. And and again, agree, it's one of the most exciting moments. It's it's one of those moments where it's me versus you, mano a mano, whoever's set to block me as I'm the, the wedge buster. It's like everything you got, bring it. When I'm the wedge setter, same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm marking my line on who's coming, the L4, L5. And it's just an opportunity to make a dynamic play. It's full speed, all out, no, no, like no mercy shown. And I think they can still execute that by, again, having the line set back. I love the idea of, I mean, the running start is where the damage is, right? I'm running down full steam ahead and a guy that's setting a wedge static, like that's a battle he can't win for both of us, right? I, I, I took a lot of big hits where, you know, I opened my eyes like, what happened? <laughs> and thankfully back, thankfully back then, I just, they let me still play. You know, we, you know I couldn't imagine if you had a concussion and they took my helmet and I couldn't go back in the game. It was just a different game back then, which is crazy to say, because I'm not that old. Right. But, uh, I mean, I love the idea of finding a way to bring that excitement back to that kickoff and kickoff return, punt, punt, just all the – that special teams unit. Again, I'm biased because it was such an important part of my, my life and my career. I think it's really important that they 
they find a way to allow the fans to enjoy that in its true essence and what it was meant to be. Hey, Izzy, throughout the course of Jeff and I's our career, in my playing career, my broadcasting career, I don't think I've ever known a player they've asked to fluctuate his body more than you. I've seen you from 260 <laughs> to 310. Um, so a couple parts of it. How did that help or hurt the special team requirements that you had? Because you're talking about a 60-yard sprint, not a not a get off the ball. And then what was easier, to lose the weight or to gain the weight? Oh, man. Well, gaining the weight was amazing. It was like – desserts appetizers <laughs> it was like it was easy you know and and that year in particular I, they took me off all special teams i was full-time three technique and nose so i was you know in the trenches playing double teams all day long i will say being so you know tall that was the only time in my career like i felt like i had lower back issues my hips my knees carrying 315 pounds and taking double teams on all day was challenging then they asked me to get back down to 265. The next season, wow. I came in about 6% body fat, 265. Uh, that was getting from the 315 to the 265 was a hard off season. I went up to a place called the House of Pain in Saline, Michigan for three weeks and just like worked out twice a day, you know, six days a week. And yeah, we, we got the weight off. I was in great shape. But being leaner was definitely better for the special teams aspect of, of my career, right? They, I was a problem in that I was, I was quick enough to run around the big guys that they tried to set to block me. And I was fast enough. And, and I was too big for the little guys who had the speed to stay with me. I would just, you know, run them over. And, and I think, you know, again, kudos to Dave Tobe and, and Jerry Angel at the time for, for saying, Hey, maybe this guy can kind of be one of our key guys on special teams and giving me the opportunity it came down to me and Michael Haynes, they said whoever played better on special teams was going to make the team. The other guy would get cut. And thankfully, um, I made a big play against Drummond in Detroit. Uh, and uh, just me one-on-one, -on -one, shoestring tackled inside the 10, and uh, I secured my spot on the 53-man on the roster. You know, you know, Izzy, uh, I, I'm surprised that as much as Devin Hester has carved out a place in special teams history, that – you haven't either, because I don't see that template of Izzy Adonage on every special teams, every kickoff coverage unit that there is. And I know they don't have the wedge anymore and they have different rules. But to me, I always think of that uniquely qualified six, five, six plus athlete that can run like you can and did, doesn't have a bigger role on special teams. Are, are you surprised as well? Yeah, I mean, when I remember, you know, Dave Tobin and I sitting down and watching film, and after kind of we started to do what we were doing and having some success, there were a few teams that tried. They put big guys on the wedge. They they, they, they tried to kind of do what we did. Thankfully, you know, um, you know, we had we had a pretty unique unit, right? So again, you know, we had like Cameron Worrell and and Brendan I and Badejo and just you know, having kind of the ingredients we did allowed us to do something really unique. And some of these other teams that tried to do that, special teams, and again, what I love about it is it's it's read and react, right? You're running down, you think this guy's going to block you and somebody else comes to block you. And, and sometimes I think a lot of the bigger guys struggle to be in such a quick environment with bullets flying left and right. And you got to be able to to react quickly, make decisions quickly, execute quickly. And something that was something, fortunately, that that I was able to do. And a lot of the big dogs, yeah, they struggle to do that. Good news, Chicago. United Airlines is getting brand new planes with all the bells and whistles like Bluetooth connectivity, screens at every seat and room for everyone's roller bag. United, proud to fly the Chicago Bears and you too. Jeff and Tom with Israel Adonage, our good friend and uh before we get into what's going on with you right now, one last question on Devin. Uh, as we'll hear in this interview uh, that we're going to play shortly, uh, it, it means a ton to Devin. He was extremely disappointed. He was not a first ballot Hall of Famer. So if if this is the, the year that he's going to get in, I, th I, I, I assured him that he will have tears in his eyes no matter how he feels about it. Um, you're a close friend of his. Uh, how important is it to him? I mean, it's really important. I think, I mean, 
what he did was so unique. I think that's why we all felt that he should have been a first ballot Hall of Famer. It, it's, it's, there is no one else that will replicate what Devin Hester has, how he has redefined and changed this game. And yes, there's been some talented re- returners. Yes, but not, none like Devin Hester. And I think when you're making these decisions on who gets in, who gets out, that criteria of like, did this guy break the mold as far as what we've known, we felt like he, he really embodied that. Not only that, if he would have stayed as a returner, it would have been even crazier over his career, right? He ended up getting shifted to a receiver, which I always felt kind of changed how he, how he, he attacked the return game because he also had to go out there and play offense. But, you know, I know he's going to be elated when he gets in, you know, third time's the charm. You know, we're, we're all really excited. We hope they get it right this time and that he, he does get into that, that hall and, and it, it's well-deserved. You know, we love him. And we're just we're just also thankful to have had even a little bit of a part in the great legacy that he's he's brought to this game. Well, speaking of legacy, uh, you're creating one in this city, that's for sure. Uh, what what you're doing is uh, it's been impactful from the moment you really got into town. Uh, you, you just had a vision for other things in life other than the sport you played, and and that was your your line of work. But by no means the last of it. Uh, the multiple philanthropic efforts. The entrepreneurism, uh, building businesses, charitable organizations, and in recent weeks now, a brand new upscale sports bar and restaurant, <laughs> Signature, uh, 1312 yeah. South Wabash. Make sure you check it out. I missed the opening. Tom, I had a tummy ache, couldn't go, uh, and I would have enjoyed delving into uh, the fine entrees and appetizers and the craft cocktails that Signature is putting out there with uh, Stephen Golanders, uh, a famous uh, name in Chicago cuisine. Tell us why. Tell us what the impact of the name Signature is all about and what should people expect when they swing by in the South Loop. Yeah, so, I mean, anyone who's looking to, to have a, a great Super Bowl experience, we'd love to have you there. We'll be there, you know, uh, you know, getting ready for the big game, and we're just so excited. I mean, throughout our career, you know, we're always eating, right? Uh, D-line dinner every Wednesday, you know, downtown, you know, Saturday before the game, we'd always go out for dinner. And after the game, family, friends, you're out for dinner at another restaurant. So over my career, I, I, I've been a restaurant guy. I've invested in probably a dozen plus restaurants over my career. Hmm. And, you know, as of late, there's a few that have been really successful to the tune that I was like, you know what, I think I'm going to do my own concept. And, you know, folks wanted me to call it Izzy's and this and that. And I wanted it to be something that represented sports, but had to have some, you know, sexiness to it. So we went through a naming exercise and signature just head above shoulders, like to have an autograph representing signature. It was just kind of embodied a great sports bar. You can come and get a world-class, beautiful, compo- beautifully composed plate uh, but you can also root on your your favorite team, and it's it's been off the charts. We have 50 employees now that that are bringing that signature experience to the city of Chicago, and uh, we're excited. We're excited. We're in talks about maybe a couple other locations, but um, I mean, it's it's just been off the charts. This is our our third week now open, and the the love, the support, the the reviews have been just off the off the charts. So as always, I say Chicago is a city that cares. That's been my experience here, and, and as a, a, a Chicago Bear, the, the love has always been so strong, and I just always want to thank the fans and the people that come out and support. It doesn't matter what, what harebrained scheme or idea that I come up with, people come out and support, and uh, I'm just so grateful and thankful for that. Izzy, uh, I'm born and raised in Joliet. I've been here my whole life. I was never going anywhere. But through the process of your professional life, being in the Chicagoland area, being around the Chicago Bears fans, when did it set into you that saying, hey, this is going to be my home? I'm not, this is the place that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be for the rest of my life. And now uh, being a multiple business owner and having the reputation in this city that you've been able to develop, when did it set in that Chicago is going to be my town? Yeah, you know, Tom, I don't know the exact moment when, where that clicked, but I'll, somewhere along the journey, you know, working on the south side with thousands of kids, trying to bring them, you know, inspiration and help them find out who 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 can they be in this world, right? Um, just being a part of a community, being a part of events and meetings and 
things that are happening. This ecosystem is just so dynamic. And, and as the journey went on, I just realized like, I, I love Chicago and, and people always say like, Izzy, what are you still doing there? It's so cold. Why aren't you going to go down to Florida or Arizona or somewhere warm? Right. You know, and the truth is I just like, Chica- I, I, I am Chicago, right? I got here. I was 21 years old, hmm. I'm 43 now. Uh, the city has just been so incredible to me. The people, you know, I can, I, regardless of what's going on, I, I can call somebody and I have support. I have love. And I always say Chicago is like a city that genuinely cares, right? People here care. And it's not just like a fly by night. Hey, can I do anything for you in Chicago? When somebody says, Hey, yeah, you know, what, what you, what do you need? How can we help you? What's going on? They genuinely mean that. And, and that's just something that's always been so important to me in my life. And so to be a part of a great community, like here in Chicago, it's, it's, it's just special. And um, I would never go anywhere, right? Chicago is home. We'll continue to be home. You know, I, we, we, Jeff and I see you on the sidelines of a lot of the Bears home games. And, uh, you know, I think it's kind of exciting for all of us ex-players to be around Soldier Field on game day. Can you kind of describe a little bit of that feeling at, at being an ex-player? Like you said, you know, when you say you're 43 years old, I, I kind of think back of when Jeff and I got to meet you at 20 years old and now you're 43. Um, but still, you know, the emotions that go through your body and mind and the people that you see on the sidelines that, you know, are so gracious and in, in greeting you, what, what's that like for you at this point in your life? Yeah, it's just, it's so special. I think one, one of the best decisions that I made two years ago were to, was, was to come to every game. So for the last two years, I've come to every game and, you know, before that I'd never come to a bears game in a, in a fan, in a fan like capacity just to watch the game. So two years ago we made the commitment. We're going to come to every game. And it was one of the best decisions just to kind of reconnect and plug back in to the fan base as I'm walking out on the field, the love, the support to be able to just to be in that energy again. And as you both know, it's, it's so unique and so special there's very few places outside of that stadium in the world where you, you have that, that, that Sunday, that game day excitement. Uh, and it's just been really revitalizing for me personally, just to be kind of plugged back into the community and the ecosystem to see the other guys that come in every year uh, to be a part of like the alumni day that they, that they have. And, and just to, to really reconnect with what that, that game and what the bears have meant to, to my life. So coming to those games, it's always exciting. It's always, it's just, you know, it's game day, right? There's, there's just nothing like it. Game day snacking calls for good foods, chunky guacamole <laughs> made with Haas avocados, tomatoes, onions, cilantro, and a squeeze of lime juice. It's the perfect snack to watch while the bears win. Score some today at your local grocery store. Game day is guac day. Israel Adonajay, our guest here on the bears, etc. podcast episode 54. So uh, as is uh, no surprise to me, Yes, you're, you're trying to build a business with Signature and another one. I don't know how many businesses you own at this point or how many you're involved with. I'd like to know that number because it's not just uh, the restaurant business, obviously. But there is a charitable avenue of this also because your, your proceeds, some of those will go to the Impact Fund. Explain what that does uh, for the, the people that need it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for us, kind of just as, as far as our formula Everything that we we do, we want to be able to have some sort of give back component. And I think if, when you just talk about like restaurants and, and the F and B space, yes, we're going to be smart about how we're buying and be efficient and and really focus on not wasting resources, especially in the world that we're in today. But in addition to that, you know, a portion of our annual revenue we're going to commit to go to the Impact Fund. The Impact Fund really focuses on education, food insecurity, and housing insecurity. The, rev, the resources from Signature and any of our restaurants ultimately will specifically be allocated to help solve food insecurity in, in Chicago. And it's just, it's shocking to us that in here we are in 2024 and the, there are families that still can't get food, right? There are people that still, you know, don't have access to nutrition and the resources to, to support kids. Yeah, how, how can you go to school when you, when you're hungry, right? When you're not getting proper nutrition. So uh, as a part of, you know, this chapter of my life that I'm, I'm in now, I really have a focus on, you know, how can I be a part of 
of ending this hunger gap, the student security gap that's here in Chicago. Obviously, it's a big it's a big fix. It's a big thing that needs support. But how can I be a part of bringing in the right players, the right voices, the right insights so we can, through a, a lens of innovation, like how can we make Chicago a city where everybody can eat, everybody can get nutrition, specifically, you know, or more importantly, our, our children. And that South Loop area, you've kind of centered on that, not only, you know, for many different things. Uh, it happens to be one mile from Social Field uh, signature. Uh, and so the certain, certainly the stadium talk in the future for the Chicago Bears, uh, a lot of discussion, obviously. Um, news coming out this week uh, that the, the Chicago uh, Lakeshore and that area still is, is on the table there. Do you have a personal opinion about a new stadium for Chicago? Absolutely. I think when you travel to some of these other markets, you'll often find the stadiums are like out in the boonies or out in the middle of nowhere or kind of offset areas. What's so special about Chicago is our stadium is right downtown in the heart of the city. It's really unique. You can come down here. Maybe you can't go to a game, but you can still come downtown Chicago. And in that South Loop area, it's buzzing. It's electric. The energy after a win it just spills out of Soldier Field, down Michigan Avenue, up to River North. It's it's unique, right? You don't have to drive 45 minutes back down to the city. You don't have to take a train or, or find your way to get back to, like, hey, what's going on? You can literally leave the stadium and be into, like, the post-game party and celebration. Uh, I, think, I think it's important that leadership, both city and the Bears, find a way not to lose that magic. Right. It, it, I think it's it's pretty special. And, and, and I think there's a deal to be done there. You know, I'm, I'm a really big fan of keeping the Bears downtown, but still allowing them to to build a facility that gets them on par with all of the other top stadiums in the league. I've been to a few of them. They're off the charts. It has to be done. We need a new facility. But can we get a win win where we bring that world class facility to this downtown area? You know, Izzy, through my lifetime of being around the old Soldier Field and the new Soldier Field, the one thing that's frustrated me is that four months a year it kind of sits dormant because there is no roof to Soldier Field. You take what you imagine happens after a Bears game, take into um, imagine what could happen all year round with the Big Ten Championship game, the Final Four, a Super Bowl, you know, all those thousands of hotel rooms within a walkable distance to Soldier Field. If I envision anything, and Jeff and I have been to every new stadium built in the NFL in the last 30 years, and when you see what some of those landmark buildings can be like, there's no reason Chicago doesn't have one of those city landmark buildings that are is a 12-month-a-year usable facility. Yeah, ag- agreed. I think I think you're, you're spot on. Whatever ends up being created, hopefully here on, on that Marshall Landing site or by Soldier Field, it has to be a dome. It has to be able to, to be utilized all year round from a, a, a myriad of different things. And, and I mean, it is, it is, if you want to be competitive in, in this league now today, you've, 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 you've got to have that, right? So I'm, I'm hoping, again, I'm hoping that, you know, with, you know, Kevin Warren and, and the leadership team and, and the voices at the table, they, they kind of can recircle up and, and dial in how to execute, you know, that vision, but keeping it downtown here in the city. All right, Israel, we'll let you go uh, real quick. Uh, what's your favorite on the menu that you can entice uh, our listeners to <laughs> head down to Signature on thirteen twelve South Wabash? Well, for 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 those burger eaters, you got to come get our signature burger. It is off the charts, and and you know, obviously, we have we have a well, we have a. a, a Short rib nacho, that's amazing as well. And if you're mm. coming for a cocktail, we have uh, our our old fashioned is our number one selling drink, and along with a drink we have called the spicy situation. So you know, come on <laughs> down. I, I try to get down there two three nights a week. So hopefully, I can see you while uh, while you're down at Signature. No question. Is the spicy? What would you call that again? The spicy what? Spicy situation. The spi- yeah. is, is that an ode to uh, Spice Adams by chance? Spicy situation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All we right. Have, we do have a few drinks that are that are named for players for sure. Nice. Uh, well, Tom and I, we got to get one named after us eventually. 
in the in the no, restaurant. Yeah. How about Tony that? Tony <laughs> needs one after him. He is he is the uh, you know the voice of Chicago. Uh -huh. So right, you know maybe he could just call it the voice of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll have to sit down with uh, Israel. All right. We appreciate you very much. Thank you for all you do. Uh, you are uh, one of the voices of Chicago. No question about it. You're, you're big in this city in more ways than you know. So we love you. We appreciate you. And we're looking forward to see the place. Thank you both. Appreciate Thanks, you. Thanks, Izzy. Thank you, Izzy. Appreciate it. Bye. Hey, when it's time to tackle some game day deals, then go with the grocer who's been a part of Chicago since 1899. Jewel Asco, the official grocery store of the Chicago Bears. Uh, you know, one, one quick thing with, with about Izzy, from the moment I met the guy, there was something different about the guy. And uh, it has proven to be the case for the 11 years that uh, we knew him as a player and all these years afterwards. Uh, one of the most impressive football players uh, slash personalities, intelligent people that I've ever met, and, and a heart of gold, a heart of gold. Yeah. His give back is unmatched. It really is, Tommy. Right. He, he's an amazing guy because where he came from, what he was able to transform himself into and out of a couple times throughout his career, always earn a spot on the roster, and then be able to develop um, the business acumen, the, what he's doing in, in the, uh, the support of nonprofit groups and the charities that he's been a part of. He's really an incredible guy, and I think if anybody has an opportunity – to go to his restaurant or get a chance to shake his hand or meet him. You know, he, he's just a super uh, part of the, you know, the background of the Bears and the background of Israel Adonage. All right, so as promised, uh, Devin Hester. We'll find out on Thursday if the third time is a charm, as Israel Adonage uh, indicated in our interview. Uh, this was a sit-down back in Orlando week two. Before the Tampa Bay game, unbelievable experience for me, a guy who called 19 of his 20 return touchdowns in his career uh, with Tommy at the at the mic as well. He thrilled us. Tommy's oohs and ahs were all over those big calls. It means everything to Devin Hester, for sure. A lot of detail about how he views it here in this interview and a sit-down with Devin Hester. That whole process was, it was very exciting for me. Um, I was like, wow, man, I'm going to be the first guy. First returner, you know what I mean? The first to open up the page for a lot of guys that's behind me that's trying to knock on the door. My, thinking back in the back of my head, I didn't make, I wasn't first draft pick, but at least I could make the first battle, be a first battle Hall of Fame. You know, that, that did come up. And when I got that call, it, it destroyed me. Like I boo-hoo cried. I, I called and, and talked to the head guy over the Hall of Fame and asked him like, I want to have a personal conversation with you because I really want to know what was told, like what went on in the meetings. The story was, as you was a very unique situation, you was a very unique person. Um, we, the voters that didn't vote for you was just proving the case that the guys that the list you was competing against, these guys had right. thousand plays more than you, you know what I mean? So we based it off of that. I said, well, okay, um, I know you picked five from the top 10. I just want to know what, what number was I? Say so you was the last one. You was the sixth man. We picked five, you was the sixth one to get cut. You was the last one to get cut. And I say, okay, wow, sixth man to get cut. I say, but explain to me, what is the Hall of Fame? And so he said, well, it's a guy that consistently does greatness year in, year out, makes the Pro Bowl, consistent base, um, makes all pro team, and is well known around the league and is well known as a player when he's out there. I say, I appreciate your, your, your compliment because you're talking to him. Yeah. <laughs> I say, I appreciate it. I say, how many players on this list that made the top 100? How many players in the Hall of Fame that made the top 100 list? We're talking about, we're not talking about the Hall of Fame. We're talking about the, the greatest 100 players of all time. And you got one sitting right here that, that didn't make the Hall of Fame. Like, how can I not make the Hall of Fame when I made the top 100? Like, I don't get it. Like, you have over 300 players in the Hall of Fame. How, how, do, I, how do I slide through the crack 
because you saying I don't have enough snaps. But when you talk about it, you explain the Hall of Fame to me. You you based it off of a player that's one of the most feared players in the league, checkbox. That teams prepare for it week in, week out, and can't sleep, checkbox. Player that makes the Hall of the Pro Bowl, checkbox. Player that makes the All Pro Team, checkbox. Player that made the All Decade Team, two checks. You forgetting one? A player who revolutionized how teams had to figure out how to prepare for one man. Yeah. And you change the way it's done. And you change the rule. Period. You change the rule. Change the rule, too. You change the rule. And in reality, if people don't know, the, the rule was changed because of me. And it's a fact. But the crazy thing about it is this is facts. I've been the sixth man get cut two years in a row. The sixth, the last person They're to get afraid cut. afraid to pull the trigger years, on two it, Two years I guess. in a row. Yeah. Two years back to back, yeah. since I've been eligible, well, two years in a row, I've been the last guy to get cut. Dan Pompey, who's on the, in the Pro Football Hall of Fame himself, in the writer's section, and is, is your biggest uh, supporter, interviewed a lot of people, mm -hmm. a lot of coordinators. You made them psycho. Yeah. They didn't know what to do with you. Right, right. Uh, you had that much of an impact. To go out there and have three or four returns and still have an impact on the game as a starting running back that carried the ball 25, 30 times a game. It's special. And I see why they call it special team. Because you have to be a special person to do it if you're great at it. It's not many that can say that. And in the situation that I was in, to really, really strike fear in opponents with only touching the ball three or four times a game, that speaks volumes. I watched a segment of Mike Tyson. And one thing that he says, when I look you in the eye, you start looking left and right. I already won the fight. And so when I would come up to the kickers and I would walk by them, like in the area where they set up punts and stuff like that, and I would ask, are you going to kick it to me today? And when they would ignore me, I knew I had already won the fight, that they was nervous. It's not really a lot of people that can say that they play offense and defense their whole life. And, Every aspect from Pop Warner to high school to the NFL, I did both. But because of what I can do with the ball in my hands. You were too valuable. It was just, you know, Coach Lovey just, he pulled me to the office after my first year. And I was like, damn, my, I know, because I boohoo cried when he told me. He was like, hey, man, I know you're a corner. I know teams are going to start kicking away from you. It's been proven. What you did with the ball in your hand, i would never seen a guy like that. I'm preparing myself because I know teams are going to start kicking away from you. So we have to find ways to get the ball in your hand. It's, what you do with the ball in your hand is very special. I boohoo cried because I said, Coach, I had this same situation from Pop Warner to high school, to college, where I never just thought on one side of the ball and just dominated. So I was so fear and so scared to yeah. move over to the offensive side of the ball because the trauma that I had in college, I was scared of that trauma. I didn't never understand offense. Let's get this straight, facts. I never understood offense. I never played a game where I went in saying that I was confident in everything that was called. Every time I broke the heart on my mind was racing. Racing, 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 racing. Terrified, you know what I mean? Oh, I don't know what I got, what I got on this plate. You know what I mean? So that's a fact. So it really, really just limited me from playing fast to second guessing myself every time I broke the huddle. Every week I was in a new meeting room, running back room, receiver room. DB room, safety room. So, and it, it traumatized me because I never was able to master one spot. So when he brought that up, it just crushed me because I was like, here we go again. Hmm. I sat out my whole junior year because I just getting played around from room to room. And that was the biggest issue with me when I got drafted was, we don't know where to put him. Because yeah. he never solidified a position. The irony of that is, moving it forward, to now, mm -hmm. your Hall of Fame candidacy, this will be year three, mm -hmm. 
and it, it almost feels like they don't know what to do with you again. They still don't. You know, it's a no-brainer, mm -hmm. and it's going to happen. Right. We've just explained why, right. but uh, it, it's so weird for me to hear you talk like this because yeah. I, great athletes, it should be a no-brainer. This is what you do. Where are you at today? When it happens, it happens. But don't get me wrong, I'm still going to be excited, you know what I mean? Yeah. As, a, as a player, you know, whenever you make the Hall of Fame, if you understand the game of football and you love it, that's the cream of the crop, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm going to treat it as, I'm pretty sure I'm going to treat it as yeah. the first you ballot. Me, when you get that call, yeah. you're going to be crying. Yeah. yeah. And you, you're going you're gonna to be one of a, a few hundred Yeah. in the 104. It, it, it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna happen. And that's why I say right now, it's, it's just a matter of time. How can Devin Hester not be a Hall of Famer? Devin has to change the darn game. And I don't think there's a question that Devin is the best player in a returner position. I mean, he revolutionized the game of football and how coaches have to cover kicks now. If you are definitely and far away the best player ever at your position, by far, there's no comparison, you're in. Hey, guys, we have a special player on our football team. Game ball, Devin. This is a guy that you can deal with, that you had the game plan that took over the game, changed the game no matter what. You knew unequivocally what he was going to do during that game that you paid your ticket or you turned on your, t turned on your TV to go watch. And he did that. So how in the world do you pick some of these guys and Devin Hester is not in the Hall of Fame? Everybody knew when he had the ball in his hands, he was different. He did it differently than anybody that had ever returned kicks and punts. And that to me is what signifies a Hall of Famer. If you are one of one, you deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. I love all the guys that are going in, but they got it absolutely wrong when it comes to Devin Hester. Also give it up for Devin Hester, the all-time. Yeah. Guys, you know how hard they, we're talking about in the history of the game. There's been a lot of great returners. You also heard the voices of Deion Sanders, Bears special teams coordinator Richard Hightower, uh, Kyle Brandt from NFL Network, of course, Lovey Smith, uh, Deion Sanders again, along with Hall of Fame quarterback Kurt Warner, Michael Irvin, and Lovey Smith to finish it out. So there, there's a whole lot more. We, we spent two hours, Tom, walking through his uh, house there in uh, Florida outside of Orlando. Uh, it's, a, it's a shrine to uh, the NFL teammates, uh, legends, uniforms hanging, framed, uh, his mementos. He saved every one of them from the time he played high school football. And, you know, remember that time at Old Hallis Hall? Uh, not the one you worked out at before the renovation to Hallis Hall. Devin took us back there. We're in the in the video room where Big Dean and those guys yeah. were set yeah. up, and he was showing us highlights of his <laughs> high school career. And it was jaw dropping. He was so proud of what he accomplished. And the takeaway that I had just from doing that interview, no one really, uh, really knew what to do with Devin. Like he was so uber talented at so many things, but other than the kick return, you knew the punt return, he was going to do that. But it was really interesting to me that all the way through his playing days, from grade school to high school to college, they kept moving him around because of his unique skill sets, his traits, the speed, the cuts, the moves. And uh, it, really, it really frustrated him, actually. Well, this listen, and he kind of took the word out because it would have been really frustrating to a lot of people. But when I listened to the interview with him that you had down in Florida, it's impressed me how important it was to him because you can take frustration two different ways. You can frustrate yourself out of the game or you can frustrate yourself into a Hall of Fame player and a contributor and a game changer in a rules evaluation. I mean, so what Devin was able to accomplish, and I, I remember one thing that shows you important, when we were back in that video room and we were watching a copy of his high school all-star game, he knew every single player in that game by just looking at their mannerisms, the number they wore, where they were from, what position they played, where they went. So Devin isn't just a, you know, a, a one-trick guy. He is a guy that's dedicated to the sport of football, and rather than allow him 
to allow frustrations to take him out of the game. He turned frustrations into a Hall of Fame opportunity. Right, and he's become a coach of his son and uh, his sons, and it is is really impressive to watch. I went to the, the, the game and uh, that weekend, and his his fire and his passion and his play calling, and his son's a great player. It's just it was a really cool uh, thing to see. Learned a lot about uh, Devin. Things I did not know. There's so much that was left on the cutting room floor about his life. Uh, nothing easy about it. Nothing easy to make that climb and to to find his way. But uh, so so much thrill he gave all of us, and uh, we certainly hope that this will be the time. Uh, a record breaking season. First player in NFL history to return an opening kickoff. The 17th anniversary of that was just a few days ago. So all the memories came coming back. The 92 yard kickoff return, and then afterwards, the slap in my rear end from Tom Thayer, who turned and pointed at me and said, with fear and anger in his face. The game hasn't even started yet. I remember that quote like it was yesterday and how true that was. Uh, the Bears did not finish the job there, but an NFL record five kick return touchdowns during the regular season last year, 84-yard punt return touchdown, week one against Green Bay at Lambeau, eight seasons, the all-time leader in kick returns with 18, 13 of the punt game, that's a record, three-time Pro Bowler, all decade of the 2000s. And interesting, when he went to Atlanta, after all those years, he finished with 20 touchdowns, the 20th one. And we got to remember he had a, a, a missed field goal return touchdown against the Giants uh, uh, out at uh, East Rutherford. Only one rushing touchdown, and that was with Atlanta. And you think about today's game and, and the fly sweeps and the, and the reverses. I mean, you kidding me? <laughs> he would have had probably a lot of touchdowns as a, as a running back as well. He really would have. Yeah, but, you know, listen, anytime Devin Hester was on the football field, it wasn't like he was an unknown. That's true. <laughs> if he was on the football field, lined up as a wide receiver, going in motion for the timing of a jet sweep, there would be four guys following him from the linebacker position to the defensive line to the defensive backfield. So, yeah, it would have been an interesting play for him throughout his career. You know, but the reason that we're having this conversation about the possibility of the Hall of Fame is because what he was able to do at the most difficult play on the football field, and that's kickoff and punt return. All right, another finalist in the senior category is our good friend Steve McMichael, your teammate, somebody you're very close to. And, uh, you know, all signs point to, uh, you know, I would say a likelihood, but you never know. We'll find out on Thursday as well. Uh, what is the McMichael camp's feelings at the moment? Um, you know, Liz Mingham will always be a Hall of Famer to me, and I'm one of those guys that's in his camp and his support, and I believe that he, he will get in. You have to really admire the job his wife, Misty, has done for him in her constant pursuit of the attention of Steve McMichael, since he can't speak for himself, that she's speaking on behalf of him to the Hall of Fame committee and to the voters and the people that are considering the senior group of um, candidates. and. To me, as proud as any Chicago Bear that's ever gone in the Hall of Fame in my lifetime, I would love to see Steve McMichael enshrined in the Hall of Fame because um, it's not, uh, like I always say, it, it's, it's not a, a pity enshrinement, it's a deserving enshrinement. You look at his numbers compared to anybody in the Hall of Fame, Steve McMichael belongs in the Hall of Fame. And I'd imagine in some uh, spiritual way, he's fighting to stay alive for this moment. I, I agree. It, it is life incentive for him. Yeah. And, um, you know, recently when I saw him, he's got an, a, a communication device that he works with his eyes. And Misty was telling me that he's been in the process of writing his acceptance speech on this machine. And three months ago, four months ago, the machine kind of frustrated him where he was, didn't want to use it. And then all of a sudden now, He's been able to become more used to using it. And you think about the incentive of writing your Hall of Fame speech on a device that's controlled with your eyes. I'm, could, I'm as proud of him for that as anything that he's been able to do. Because the bottom line is nothing else works in his body. Nothing. Right. That's in, incredible. That's right. incredible. Wow. Tastes like Miller time. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. All right, Tom. We'll pray for, for Ming. Uh, not only his, uh, his family, but him. And uh, let's hope it all comes through on Thursday. All right. The Super Bowl is on Sunday. 
Uh, let's get our thoughts on the table for that real quick. Kansas City uh, trying to, to repeat for the first time. Uh, it hasn't happened since the Bill Belichick Patriots, 2003-2004, so it's been 19 years. Uh, what do you? Uh, how do you rate their chances against the San Francisco 49ers and Brock Purdy in his second year, uh, Super Bowl starter, and just watching him on opening night and all the uh, the stage and cameras and questions. This guy is so poised. He handles himself with unbelievable, uh, unbelievable uh, 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 moxie, and and he's just yeah. he's something else. He really I is. love his self-confidence, but it's hard to go against Patrick Mahomes. The guy is creative, vision, arm talent. They have uh, Pacheco, the running game, that is, is you know, helping out. So unless San Francisco's defense does something uniquely challenging up front, take advantage maybe of the offensive tackles, that's the most penalized aspect of the Kansas City Chiefs, I still think – it's Patrick Mahomes and uh, Andy Reid are are the favorites. I'd like to see San Francisco win, but I'm pulling. I'm, I mean, I think Kansas City will win. And the last time they met was in 2022. Kansas City scored 44 points, and now it's a different team. Ooh. They beat San Francisco in that game. I think it, it could be a bit of a fireworks show. I really do. I think uh, the type of mindset that Kyle Shanahan has. And uh, I don't know if it's going to come through a ground attack that's going to try and, you know, really uh, make mincemeat out of the, the uh, defensive uh, of the 49ers, uh, excuse me, of the Kansas City Chiefs, or if it's going to be an aerial show. But uh, one thing is I think we're going to see outstanding quarterback play. I do. You know what? At the end of the day, we're going to be talking about Shanahan. And I think his reputation is on the line a little bit because he's been in the Super Bowl before. And what he's done in the second half of Super Bowls and calling plays and it's showed a, the collapse of the Atlanta Falcons to what he hasn't been able to accomplish in his opportunities to get the NFC Championship game and beyond. So I, I think it's uh, Kyle Shanahan for not ever taking a snap, never being a stance. He's going to have a big part of the outcome of this game. All right, I'm going to go with the 49ers in this one. I guess my heart's with with Brock Purdy and company, but uh, it will take a monumental effort to stop uh, the best quarterback in the NFL right now, and that's Patrick Mahomes. Yep. He finds a way. Uh, he just makes plays, but so does Brock Purdy. I mean, that's the one thing. He, he just finds a way to make plays. So who makes more plays? That usually winds up the reason why a quarterback who makes the most plays, and I know defense wins championships too. We'll find out who's the better defense on this particular day. We visit Hard Seltzer, flavors for every vibe. Celebrate responsibly, Molson Coors Beverage Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Game day snacking calls for good foods, chunky guacamole made with hot avocados, tomatoes, onions, cilantro, and a squeeze of lime juice. It's the perfect snack to watch while the Bears win. Score some today at your local grocery store. Game day is guac day. You know, sit in front of your TV watching a Super Bowl, you're going to be... Mingling with friends and having uh, some of your favorite uh, appetizers and such. What do you got cooking? Um, have you ever heard of Ernie, Sweet Lou, and Rudy? Yep, they'll be your buddies on Super That's Bowl my Sunday. Three dogs. You know what? I, I, I do. I, we talk about the playoff games, and there's still that envy inside of me yeah. that yeah. I watch the Super Bowl with that. Um, so no, I, I will watch the game, um, and uh, you know, I, I just hope it's a good game and. If it gets frustratingly out of touch, I'll probably turn it off and take the dogs for a walk. <laughs> well, we'll be back Thursday night on Bears Weekly on ESPN 1000, a 6.30 start time. We've moved that start time now, 6.30 to 7.30, with Jim Miller from Sirius XM NFL Radio. Check us out then. For Tom Thayer, I'm Jeff Joniak. Thanks to our guest, Israel Adonijay, and we'll talk to you next week. Please subscribe now in the Chicago Bears official app, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Bear down, everybody. 